Let's talk knees, specifically TPLOs. This is the most common orthopedic procedure that I do. And this video is meant to just give you an idea of anatomy, surgery, what to expect post-operatively. And I do have to let you know about complications, even though the success of the surgery is quite excellent. So let's talk about anatomy. The anatomy of a dog's knee is very similar to ours. The two major bones that make up our knee, we have the top thigh bone, which is the femur. We have the bottom shin bone, which is our tibia. Our kneecap sits within a groove on the bottom of the femur and where those bones bend is our knee or stifle joint. There are many supporting ligaments and cartilages in the knee, but the big key player here is our cranial cruciate ligament. This is the star of our show for this little lecture. The cranial cruciate ligament is interchangeable with the human term, which is the anterior cruciate ligament or ACL. Unlike injuries that we see in people, which are often athletic, there are a number of reasons why dogs tear their ACL. We know there's some genetics that are involved. There's some degeneration of the ligament, overweight dogs. There's a whole long list. Now it is super common in dogs that are two pounds all the way up to our 200 pound big mama jamma dogs. This is a progressive process. Think about the cranial cruciate ligament like a rope. There are many fibers in that rope that may slowly tear and break down over time. Sometimes it's a really rapid, complete tear, but often the fibers of that rope will break down and you may start with a partial tear that will then progress to a complete tear. Most often, even partial tears will warrant surgery. What we see with partial and complete tears is loss of the surface of the bone or the articular cartilage that your dog only has when they're born. And we also see damage to the cushions between the two bones, particularly the medial meniscus, and we'll see thickening along the inside of the joint capsule, which is called medial buttress. And I always think about it as you're feeling your dogs with these chronic CCL tears, it almost feels like a goose egg sitting right in the middle of your dog's knee on the inside. The test that we will do to diagnose this is a test called tibial thrust. If your dog is positive for tibial thrust, the tibia or shin bone is moving inappropriately in respect to the femur. And that's what's resulting in all of that damage. TPLO stands for tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. And I'm gonna explain what each of those terms mean. Looking at this x-ray, I think is very helpful. When we are looking at the bone, what is a little bit different and unique about dog knees compared to ours is the angle or the slope of the top of the tibial bone. That slope, the term is called the tibial plateau. We make a measurement of the tibial plateau angle. While your tibial plateau is generally pretty flat, the average tibial plateau angle for a dog is about 30 degrees. Why is this important? That top of that shin bone or tibia is a downward ski slope. Now, if you look at the anatomy of the femur, the bottom of the femur has these rounded condyles. So think about it conceptually, like you have a basketball sitting on top of a 30 degree ski slope. And it's held there by our friendly trusty rope, which is our cranial cruciate ligament. When that rope tears and force is distributed through the leg or your dog bears weight, that basketball is rolling down the hill. And this is our thrust that we just discussed. And so what we wanna do is we have our tibial plateau. We actually wanna level that or flatten that. So think about pushing a ball on a flat street. It's no longer going to roll backwards or forwards. It's going to stay stable. And so we're eliminating the instability by changing the shape of the top of the tibia. Now we do that with an osteotomy. An osteotomy just means that I am on purpose making a cut into the bone. And so there you have it, TPLO, tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. 
How we make that cut in the bone is by taking a special saw that looks like a semicircle and it's going to cut into that hillside directly on the top of that tibia and then we're going to rotate that piece of bone in place so we are flattening that tibial plateau angle to about five degrees. That is going to eliminate the instability and that is going to eliminate the need for the rope altogether. Okay. We then stabilize that rotation and we make measurements on every individual dog with special positioned x-rays of the knee. And it's a little different for each dog based on the size of your dog, based on the angle of that tibial plateau and the plate that we're putting on. On average, if you have a Labrador sized dog, we're rotating that piece of bone in place maybe by a centimeter or so. That's not a lot, but that is really going to create a lot of stability in that knee. And that rotation is maintained by putting on a plate and screws. So that will heal over about a 10 to 12 week period, and that will permanently stabilize the knee. Now that plate and screws are so very, very important for everything to heal and stay in place during that recovery period. But once we take x-rays at that final recheck period and show that the bone is completely healed, then those plate and screws in theory don't need to be there anymore. And we could remove them if we wanted to, but we're not going to put your dog under any unnecessary surgery. So 99% of dogs live with that metal for the rest of their lives. Let's briefly talk about complications. Here's the good news. The success of this surgery is excellent. In my hands, I see about 5% of complications with this surgery, most of which are treatable, many which are preventable. And the key to preventing complication is everyone involved in the recovery of your pet working as a team and following instructions. Following post-operative care instructions with exercise restriction and physical therapy is really going to reduce the likelihood of complications occurring. I provide you a great, great detailed discharge statement as well as very helpful instructional physical therapy videos and at-home care to guide you all along the process. The number one complication that we see, which fortunately is still infrequent, is infection. It is so important that your dog or any dog is not licking at that incisional area. A cone is going to be so effective to prevent licking. We do love to use lick sleeves when you're directly supervising your pet, but it is not a foolproof method to prevent your pet from licking and chewing. So an e-collar is always going to be an important part of the recovery and needs to be on at all times when you're not directly supervising your dog. How do you know if your pet has an incisional infection? The incision may start to open and may start to have some drainage of bloody fluid. A little bit of bruising and swelling is normal. It is extremely common to see swelling that goes down to the level of the ankle after a few days. That is just gravity bringing the swelling from the knee down to the ankle and a little bit of gentle massage of the ankle is great. We always recommend icing in the beginning of recovery to help with pain. Pain control is a huge part of our recovery that from the day of surgery to when your pet is home with you, we do a local block called a femoral sciatic block to help with pain control control at the time of surgery. That is a wonderful tool that will make your pet comfortable. But just so you are aware, when we do a femoral sciatic block for 12 to 24 hours in a small percentage of dogs, you may see a little bit of weakness or dragging of the foot from that block when you take your dog home. That will go away. So do not be concerned about that. We also love to do local pain control at the surgical site. We use a long acting local anesthetic called Noceta that lasts for three days and it's a slow release. And that's going to also keep your dog super comfortable after surgery. And that's supplemented by oral medications that your vet will prescribe. It's very important that your dog's kept quiet because too much activity can put stress on the implants. If you think about the screw, think about it like a really heavy duty um, stainless steel paper clip. You bend it enough times, what's going to happen? It's going to break. So I have seen screws break back out, plates fail, even bones break because dogs are doing too much activity and the team is not working together to rest your dog properly to allow the bone to heal. Having your dog use the leg in a controlled way is very beneficial. That will help the bone heal that will help take stress away from the other side. 
because 50% of dogs on average will tear both sides in their lifetime. So we really want to minimize the amount of stress that's displaced from one leg to the other. It's very rare that we will have failure of the implants if you are following instructions at home. I briefly talked about the fact that most dogs live with their plates lifelong, but there is a small percentage of dogs where after the bone is healed, I will recommend plate removal. It's less than 1% of the time, and it's usually because of an infection that keeps popping up or has become resistant and removing the metal will solve the problem. This is not the same kind of intensive surgery and is done on an outpatient basis with a much shorter recovery, but we obviously want to avoid that if we can. We haven't really talked about the meniscus except to say that we know the loss of the CCL results in damage, mostly to the medial meniscus. In more than half the dogs at the time of surgery, I am seeing a meniscal injury. And when I see that meniscal injury, I will address that damaged portion and remove that because it is a source of pain. When the meniscus is intact, every surgeon has a different approach as far as handling a normal meniscus, but I do what's called a meniscal release and that will take pressure off the meniscus. It will reduce the likelihood of a meniscal tear in less than 1% of the time. I will have to go back in and do any kind of surgery in the knee joint to address the meniscus, but it's still a small possibility. Sometimes you can get a fracture postoperatively. This is well less than 1% of the time, but it's been documented in some of the literature. With too much activity or inappropriate stressors to those bones, you can see a fracture of the tibial tuberosity, the tiny little fracture in the kneecap, as well as fractures in the fibula. This is extremely rare and uncommon, but they have been reported. Very unlikely, but there's a pretty big vessel that runs behind the shin bone that can potentially be compromised at the time of surgery and cause significant bleeding. Again, well less than 1% of the time, and it's not something that would happen at home, but I want you to be aware. Overall, most dogs do beautifully and heal within a three month period. Often recommend taking x-rays somewhere between eight to 12 weeks, and we detail those in your instructions to go home. Physical therapy is a huge part of your pet's recovery, but ultimately it's a lot of tough love for a few months. To prepare yourself at home, I would heavily recommend that you don't hate the crate. It is so important to have a crate during recovery. I love a crate because it has a roof. Your dog can't jump over the crate, can't get out of the crate, and you know that when you leave your dog in the crate, you're gonna find your dog in the crate later on, and they're not gonna get into any trouble, and they're gonna stay truly rested. During the recovery, your dog cannot get on furniture, cannot run to read the Amazon Prime guy, cannot play with other dogs, cannot rough house, should not be going up and down stairs unsupervised. Now, if you have outdoor stairs to go in and out of the house, that's perfectly fine. Everything outside the house is gonna be on a leash and we will gradually build up your leash walks and your physical rehabilitation program. And I should just really stress that the entire recovery period, set it as three months in your mind, your dog is created inside the house when you're not directly sitting down on the ground with them, directly supervising them and monitoring their behavior. You will get a detailed printout of instructions and please use my website and go into the post-operative instruction tab and all of these things have specific specific videos, including icing, lick sleeve, crating, physical therapy for more passive and active types of motion. But the most important thing that you need to think about is that your dog essentially is like a chronic toddler. They are not going to regulate their own activity. And so this is a period of creating boundaries and tough love because the success of your dog's surgery is largely dependent upon following these instructions and your participation in keeping your dog confined and doing very well controlled regimented physical therapy. They go hand in hand. Too much activity will cause complications and that's exactly what we wanna avoid. We want this to be successful. Each week your dog should increase the use of that leg slowly but surely. So if at any point you feel like your dog is having a setback and not using the leg, then I want you to follow up with your veterinarian to make sure that we're on the right track. 
Typical recheck schedule at a minimum is going to be the first two weeks to look at the incision, midway in between around four to six weeks to make sure that we're on the right track and remind you that your dog needs to be restricted. And then around 10 weeks to take x-rays to document that your pet is healed. Only until we see that there's healed bone where we've made that cut, can your pet start to do unrestricted activity. And that is going to be a slow, gradual return over three to four weeks with the last thing to come back into your dog's life being rough housing, dog park kind of play. Slow and steady wins the race and working together with me, your vet and following instructions will ensure an excellent outcome and your dog will be running around in no time.